Hello, good afternoon to all of our viewers here at the Facebook page of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association. I am Dean Marisol Aninias. I'm an alumnus of the Ateneo Law Batch 2000 and I am a member of the Board of Trustees of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association. I'm currently the President of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. Welcome to the Web Lecture Series Project of the ALAAI. This is one of the projects being undertaken by the association to serve our students, our alumni, our school, and our community. Through these lectures, we will be bringing to your screens and into your individual locations the latest in the law. And now to learn a little bit more about the ALAI, may I introduce to you the president of the association, Attorney Nena Rosales. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Mayayong hapon kinyang tanan. The Ateneo de Manila Law Alumni Association is continuously striving to serve the community despite the circumstances. We rely on the expertise, talent, and generosity of our alumni, like Court of Appeals Justice Filomena Singh, Dean Marisol Ananias, Dean Mel Santa Maria, the members of the Board of Trustees headed by our Chairman, Teddy Cruz, to do so successfully. I am certain that today's step-by-step -step guide on the application of the 2019 amendments of the Rules of Civil Procedure will be quite enlightening. We do hope you will continue to join us again in all our future activities. Thank you, and back to you, Dean Matt. Thank you, President Nena. Now, I hope everyone will bear with us. So there may be some disruptions due to connectivity issues, but if that happens, just please stay on the page until we go back on air. Also, we are allotting time after the lecture for questions. The Justice will be answering the questions that we can post at any time during the lecture at the comments section under this live lecture video. And with that, we will start with our web lecture series. Our first speaker for today, our first lecturer, is no stranger to the Ateneo. She is an alumnus of the Ateneo Law School and a member of its faculty. She is currently an Associate Justice of the Court of Appeals, and she is a member of the Supreme Court Subcommittee on the Revision of the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure. And so, Welcome our first lecturer, Justice Phil Maria Filomena Singh, who will be delivering the lecture today entitled Step-by-Step -step Litigation in the New Rules of Civil Procedure. So we'll be starting with Module 1 that will be re uh, regarding pleadings, motion, and um, um, service of the pleadings. So um, without further ado, may I turn over the floor to the main event to our lecture for today, Justice Monet Singh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Dean Marisol Ananias, the president of the PALS, the Philippine Association of Law Schools, for her introduction. And of course, President Nena Filomena Rosales, my namesake, no? uh, for, uh, well, for coming up with this, uh, with this idea of me uh, delivering a sharing session, I don't want to call it a lecture, it's a sharing session, on how we can uh, practically the revisions in the rules on civil procedure in our, uh, well, in our practice and also the, for the judges who are listening to us today in the way that they handle their civil cases. Okay, so we'll proceed directly into the first slide. By the way, I'm going to be assisted today by Attorney Lala Rosales, uh, a very, very good friend of mine. And uh, I take pride in having a Harvard, a Harvard law graduate doing my, uh, assisting me my slides, no? Okay, so we'll go to the first slide, which is uh, the law of ordinary civil actions. By the way, this is a two-module uh, two webinar. The first module today will take up Rules 1 to 17 of the Rules on Civil Procedure. And then tomorrow, we'll do 18 until judgments. No? But um, 
please do not expect me to focus on the on a comparison of the 1997 rules and the amended provisions uh, that you're going to do today. Rather, I was I was really very excited when Nena asked me to come up with a new perspective of presenting the revisions. I said, Nena, I think it will be more productive and useful for our listeners if we can present to them the process flow. So what we're going to do today is follow the process of a civil case from the start, meaning the filing, up to its um, conclusion, which is which may be judgment. No? So this first slide will show you the incidents that um, will bring us to the conclusion of a civil case, no? And it starts with the initiatory pleadings, and then you have the summons, and then you have responsive pleadings, and then you have interlocutory matters, which is followed by pretrial, trial, judgment, and execution, okay? Let's go to the next slide, please, Lala. On the next slide, you will see that I divided our discussions today into four, no? First will be the initiatory pleadings, and then you have the summons, and then you have the responsive pleadings, and then you have the interlocutory matters, which will cover motions and special dismissals. Now, under inter initiatory pleadings, of, we will discuss the cost of action, subject matter jurisdiction, venue, parts and contents, and filing service. No? And under, under summons, we will discuss diction over persons, the modes of service, and then the return and proof of service. Under responsive pleadings, we will discuss bill of particulars, the answer, the reply and rejoinder, filing and service, and default. And under interlocutor, interlocutory matters, as I already mentioned, we'll discuss motions and special dismissals. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, okay, this, I'm very excited about the chart because this flow chart, I tried to put all those, uh, all those incidents, those step-by-step -step incidents in one flow chart, no? But of course, you may say that this is too simplistic. And that is true because that is the very purpose for the revisions this year in our rules and civil procedure. We wanted to streamline trial, no? Um, year after year in the um, ease of doing business uh, survey conducted by the World Bank, the Philippines always rates very poorly. We are always at the bottom, no? And the reason for this is because even a simple sum of money case, no, a contract, a breach of contract case involving a involving sum of money takes from three to five years in our trial courts, no. But uh, you you cannot and should not blame this on the on the trial courts alone, no. Uh, a good deal of the delays in our litigation have to do with the rules that we have. I, I actually call them archaic rules, and so. Finally, with the new revisions, we are able to streamline our litigation process and able to take out a lot of the interlocutory incidents that cause delay. No? I am very excited about this because these are the practices that uh, a lot of our judges have been uh, implementing in their court for a while now, and which I also practice in my courts for the years that I was a trial judge. But uh, now they have been institutionalized. I know that there is a great... Um, well, that there is a wariness on the part of our practitioners no, and our litigants as to these changes. And um, many are also saying that it's going to entail a lot of work. no. But uh, that is not true. We are just moving up the work that you do in an ordinary litigation to the outs instead of doing it piecemeal as the trier cases or prosecutor cases. We are now pushing everything up to the front. And then when you do the rest of the litigation, it's easier for everyone, not just the judges, but also for the litigants. Okay. So in this flow chart, you will see, no, you will see that we start with uh, we start with a uh, filing of the initiatory pleading. You see it there. And then you, you have dismissal under rule 9.1. No, these are for the these are for the causes that uh, are not waived. That's like lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, um, litis pendentia, res judicata, and prescription. Okay, and then you have there yes or no, yes at the bottom. If there is a dismissal, then that's the end. No, but if you to the to the arrow which says no, no, no dismissal, meaning that dismissal is denied or it's not allowed. No, then we issue some, and then there is service of some. Then at the bottom is service.
if it's okay, if it's not okay, it may, it may result to a dismissal for failure to acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant. And then that will be the end of the case as well, no? Or it can be a yes, meaning there was proper service of months and the defendant. And so jurisdiction acquired over the person of the defendant. Then we proceed to the next step, which is file a return. Um, officer of the court who served must file a return. And then the answer is filed, no? If the answer is filed, yes, then you go to next arrow. You can either file a motion for summary judgment or a motion for judgment on, on the pleadings if the circumstances warrant. No? Otherwise, you file your answer. But if there is no answer filed, you go up. That's under, uh, and, and that, that will now fall under the provisions on default, no? You move for the declaration of the defending party in default, no? If the motion is granted and an order of default is issued, then you cross all the way down, no? And we go to the presentation of evidence for the plaintiff, no? There on, in trial, no? However, if there is no declaration of default, no? You have to issue or the court issues a pretrial notice and sets pretrial. Then you go to the, you go to the uh, stage there of pretrial where you see pretrial and then you have court annex mediation and then you have judicial dispute resolution. You will see that court annex mediation and judicial dispute resolution are in bro uh, are surrounded or, or um, captured in broken line because these two stages may not be necessary if there is a settlement already at the pre-trial before the judge, no? All right. And then at the bottom, you see the box there, successful. If yes, then you render judgment. The court renders judgment. The, the settlement of the party will be the end, of the, the end of the litigation. But if not, we go again to the, to the box on trial, not to the stages under trial. So trial, a plaintiff's presentation of evidence can be a demur to evidence no, on the part of the defendant. If this is not granted, then we proceed to trial with the defendant present evidence. But if this is granted, then again, we skip the presentation of evidence for the defendant and we go to render judgment and then that's the end of the civil litigation. No? This is just a depiction of the steps or the process flow of a civil case. Is to know that there are other incidents that may come into that may come into the different phases that I have uh, that I have shown here. But please remember, this is your basic process flow, okay? And the reason why I thought of doing this is because the major revisions in the rules on civil procedure focus on fixing timelines for each of these major stages. And the reason behind that is that the Chief Justice, Justice Peralta, uh, well. Has, uh, well, well, has come to the conclusion, which is actually uh, no, which is actually correct, that it has been very hard to gauge the efficiency and effectiveness of our uh, courtesies without timelines, no? Because true enough, the judges or the, the courts may render the judgments within the periods decreed in the constitution, but if, if they take all, they may have rendered the decision within 30 days if summary or 90 days if regular. But if they took five years or seven, to hear the case, then that is actually self-defeating, no? And so, and so that is the reason why we thought of putting timelines and really, and really compartmentalizing each of these phases. So now with this process flow, with this flow chart, we can see how the work is going to be done. At any given point in the litigation, you know where you are. This is the other challenge that we seek to address by making it so simple and plain as this, no? Of course, in real life, it's not going to be so simple, especially with lawyers and judges involved, no? But what I mean is for laymen, no? That's one of the greatest disservice that we, that we are all guilty of, mutually guilty of, no? Most of the litigants do not understand what's happening in their case, no? largely dependent on what the lawyers tell them and also on what they hear from the judge. But, you know, even, even when I was a judge, I could not explain step by step to all my litigants, no? And so with this very clear process flow, hopefully everybody will know at which stage in the process they are and they will be able to the necessary questions and concerns, if not with the court and at least with their lawyers, right? Let's go to the next slide, please, Lala. Okay, so now I'm showing the flow of ordinary civil actions. Okay, okay so... 
Um, and we're starting with initiatory pleading already here. Okay, so as I already mentioned, we're going to discuss this matter under initiatory pleading. It's the cause of action. The first question you ask is, do you have a cause of action? Okay, and we not only ask this for reason, uh, well, for ethical reasons, because uh, our oath, our attorney's oath, is us, okay, not to pursue any any uh, meritless cause, no? And so, but we are doing this for a very, very pro practical and logical reason, no? You can only pursue a case and win it if you have a valid cause of action, right? And then, so the next thing is, do you have subject matter jurisdiction? Which court has the subject matter jurisdiction over your cause of action? You may answer yes to the first question. You have a cause of action. But then if you do not bring it to the proper court that has subject matter jurisdiction, your cause of action may be thrown out of okay. And then the third, venue. Okay, so we we have a cause of action. We know which court has subject matter jurisdiction over it, but at which venue? should your cause of action be filed? Let's just say it's a sum of money case, okay? And let's say it exceeds, well, let's say it exceeds 400,000 pesos. And we know that that's the regional trial court, no? Under BP 129, section 19, the regional trial court has subject matter jurisdiction over that particular cause of action. But which regional trial court? We have, I think, over a thousand regional trial courts now all over the country. That is talking about venue, okay? So venue is about the geographic alone or the place where you file your cause of action. Okay, and then the next one is parts and contents. What must your initiator contain? How must your cause of action be alleged? Let's discuss this here. Note, please, that now uh, with the revision, we don't only have parts of a pleading, no? We also have contents now. And it dictates to you what you should allege in your pleading. Failing in which your pleading may be susceptible to dismissal for failure to state a cause of action, all right? And then the, the last one here under initiatory is filing and service. How do you file your initiatory pleading and how do you serve your initiatory pleading? Those are two different actions. Let's go to the slide, please, Lala. Okay, ordinary civil actions. What is an ordinary civil action? Remember that uh, the rules in civil procedure do not apply only to ordinary actions, but also to, but also to special civil actions, all right? So a civil action on the screen you will see is the definition of Rule 1.3, okay? It is um, one which is pursued uh, for the enforcement or protection of a right or the redress or prevention of a wrong, no? And the requirement is there under Rule 2, Section 1, no? That every ordinary civil action must be based on a cause of action. And we all know that action has three elements, no? The plaintiff's legal right, the defendant's correlative obligation to respect the plaintiff's uh, legal right. And then the third, of course, is the most important, the defendant's act or omission, which violates the plaintiff's right. And then the next will just show you a quote, no, as to test determine the existence of a cause of action from the heirs of Maramag case, no, a 2009 case, no. Of course, we also know that um, the test is applied by hypothetically admitting all the factual allegations in the complaint, no. Uh, of course, we only admit the factual allegations. We do not admit conclusions of law. And we do not admit allegations that are legally impossible or those that are inadmissible in evidence as enumerated in the case of Maramag on the screen. There will be some slides where I have jurisprudence for you just as a review, which I will not discuss in detail, okay? We will just go through them very quickly, okay? We'll go to the next slide now. Again, the cause of action, what is the test, no? Okay, so um, we have the court rule 8.1, which is a new one, um, which is which actually embodies our ship, no? a radical ship from ultimate facts to evidence and facts. No? Later, when we get to rule 8.1, I'll show that to you. And then rule 7.6 is um, the contents of a pleading, an initiatory pleading in particular, which requires not just the summary, of his testimonies, but also the judicial affidavits, including the, the document object evidence. Again, we'll get to that later on, right? Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so now, now a prohibition, or just as a review, there is a prohibition against mere causes of action, no? So the, uh, this is our mechanism against multiple suits and also against, well, possible conflicting decisions, okay? So the rule is, first of all, that every every action must plead one, one okay? And the second rule or the, the one that goes at the corollary rule is that you can not state a cause of action, okay? Um, because it will now become your your causes of action, which will be susceptible to dismissal of litis pendentia or res judicata. Okay, on the next slide, we discuss joinder of causes of action. Under Rule 2.5, we are told that we may assert in the alternative or otherwise as many causes of action as may as we may have against the opposing party. No, there are just conditions that you must comply comply with. Of course, um, you have to apply with the rules regarding the joinder of parties, okay? And the joinder shall also not include special civil actions or actions which are governed by special rules, no? Okay. And then multi new causes of action involving the same parties, the RT subject matter jurisdiction, and the venue is properly laid with the same court, okay? So the court must have subject matter jurisdiction and the venue must also be proper for the court to take of the causes of action that are joined. No? And lastly, if all the causes of action are principally for recovery of money, then we have the we have the totality rule. No? Uh, okay. And then the next slide will just give you a an again another quote regarding uh the purpose for the joinder of causes of action. I already mentioned them to you uh, as against uh, as a mechanism against multiplicity of suits. The next uh, slide of parties um, shows you the rule under Rule 3.6, no? So all persons in whom or against whom any right to relief in respect to or arising out of the same transaction or series of transactions is alleged to exist, whether jointly, severally, or in the alternative, may be joined as plaintiffs in one complaint or as defendants in one complaint. They have common questions of fact or law, uh, which arise in the cause of action, no? So, of course, you also have uh, misjoinder of parties or non joint and even non-joinder of parties that result to dismissal of the case. It's not a ground for dismissal, okay? Let's go to the totality rule, which is on the next slide, as I already mentioned. Okay, so the uh, uh, best example we can give here is a series of loans, no? Between the same debtor and creditor. So the total must be the subject matter jurisdiction of the court, right? And then the next slide, okay, that's rule 8.2. A party may forth two or more statements of a claim or defense alternatively or hypothetically, either in one cause of action or defense or in separate causes of action or defenses. When two or more statements are made in the alternative, no, if one would be sufficient, pleading will not be rendered insufficient by the insufficiency of one of the other alternative statements okay so when i was still a practitioner i practiced law also uh, for 10 years before i joined the bench uh, i would i would have this no in my pleadings no i'd have a first cause of action and have a second cause of action no and and um, there they may not always be in sync no there may be alternative causes of action one example we can give is perhaps the the, the main cause of action is for breach of a for contract, no? So you can ask for your first cause of action maybe for the specific performance, no? Of, uh, let's say it's the payment uh, that was not complied with, okay? Uh, you are asking by way of your first cause of action for the payment of the bills on that contract. But in the alternative, no? As an alternative cause of action, you may ask instead for the return of the property if that is allowed under the particular suing under, no? Uh, if payment of the balance can no longer be, no? So that is an example of your alternative cost or, or your multiple causes of action, right? And then we have uh, the next slide on misjoinder of action. Again, to stress, like misjoinder of parties, it is not a ground for dismissal of the action. Rather, the court may order the other cause of action pursued separately. All right. Okay. And then um, the next slide with you another quote, okay, regarding misjoinder of causes of action. Okay, now let's go to pleading your cause of action. How, how are causes of 
uh, pleaded in court. And then um, we are ready now to do Rule 6.1, where it states that pleadings are statements of the respective claims and defenses of the parties. And the claims are T, okay, are supposed to be asserted in a complaint, a counterclaim, a cross claim, third party complaint, etc. It may be a fourth party complaint and a complaint in intervention. The next slide shows you the definition of a complaint, no? Under 6.3, it is the plea which alleges the plaintiffs or claiming parties of action. Okay, the only revision uh, is to add the phrase claiming parties, no? Because we're not limited to a plaintiff, you have also a counterclaimant, no? And you, you can have a cross-claimant or a party complaint, uh, third party. They are all actually plaintiffs, but we just thought of making it more clear. So we use the phrase claiming party. All right. And then from jurisprudence there, you have the utility or purposes for the you know, to inform the defendant clearly and definitely of the claims against him so that he may prepare to meet the, uh, the issues at trial and then to inform the defendant of all material facts, which the plaintiff relies upon to support the claim. And last is to state the theory of a cause of action, okay, which forms the, the plaintiff's claim, okay. And then let's go to the counterclaim. Of course, as we all know, a counterclaim that a defendant has against the plaintiff, okay, and we also know that it can be either a compulsory or a permissive counterclaim. Now, in the recently uh, concluded bar examination, um, this is one of the questions I asked in remedial law, no? the difference between a compulsory and a permissive counterclaim. And sadly, uh, a lot of the examinees were unfamiliar with the distinctions. And so I th thought of uh, just giving some jurisprudence here for everybody's uh, review of the difference between a compulsory and a permissive counterclaim. And you will see that in the succeeding slide, okay? And of course, our rule is there you have the relationship test, which is the most common, commonly used test. No? And of course, the rule is that the compulsory counterclaim, which is not raised, is barred already. Now let's go to the cross-claim. Okay, you may raise cross-claim. Who may raise a cross-claim? Cross-claim is raised by one party against a co-party. You may have you may have you may have co-defendants, more than one defendant. So it's a claim by one defendant against the other defendant. Okay, so it must arise out of the transaction occurrence, which is the subject me, sub, subject matter either of the original action or of, or of the claim. Okay, and on the next slide, you have the third party or fourth party complaint. Okay, and um, note here, okay, that it is done or admitted only with leave of court, no? And, um, course, this will go through the process you will see later on in our litigious models, uh, how the court will act on a third party or a fourth party complaint. Okay? Uh, the, the most classic uh, example give here is derogation in the case of insurance claims, no? where the insurer pays for the um, claim and gets separated and steps into the shoes no? of the insured. Okay? And um, Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now this is a new provision, okay? A third party complaint or a fourth party complaint, etc., shall be denied admission now under three circumstances. Okay. The first is when the third or fourth party complaint cannot com uh, defend the defendant to the third party or fourth party complaint can be located within 30 calendar days from the grant of no, to file the third party or fourth party complaint that's the first exception okay so this one is not a ground for the disallowance because in this particular instance the um the third party or fourth party complaint was already uh, allowed or admitted by the court and someone had already issued okay but uh someone's could not be served within 30 days from the time that the court allowed the uh, filing of the third party complaint and it is an exception because we don't want a necessary delay to the main case okay if the original parties the original plaintiff and defendant are already before the court we don't 
a third party or fourth party defendant who cannot be located to cause any undue delay to the main case, right? The exception is when matters extraneous to the issue in the principal case are raised, okay? So, so an example of an extraneous matter may be um, A versus B, sum of money. Now, B, third party come against C, no? Because um, B says that uh, uh, the sum of money that uh, he A he actually lent to C, okay? And so he C, uh, B seeks to bring in C as a third-party defendant, no? So, of course, between A and that is a matter which is totally extraneous, no? And so that may cause the court to deny the allowance of a third-party complaint will cause undue delay to the conclusion of the main case, all right? Okay, and then the last um, exception is that the effect would be to introduce do separate controversy action, okay? So, um, in the same example, A versus B, sum of money. Now, B seeks uh, file a third party, com B versus A and C. So, uh, no, B versus C, no? And so, it's a counterclaim against A, but B wants to file a third party against C, who was uh, who's not an original party, because B says that I have a claim uh for a share in property which A and C co-owns. No? It's a totally extreme matter and is best litigated in a separate controversy. Right. Okay, so now let's go to jurisdiction. That's the next slide. And when we speak of jurisdiction, we're talking about subject matter jurisdiction, okay? And that refers to the power of the court to uh, hear, try, and decide a case, okay? And then how do we determine jurisdiction? First, we'll know that jurisdiction is determined by the allegation complaint, no? And we are we are confined to the four corners of the initial leading uh, determining subject matter jurisdiction. We also know, okay, that jurisdiction is confirmed by law. It is not subject to the will of the parties. Parties cannot stay regarding jurisdiction of the court, okay? It cannot also be diminished in any manner or added to, and neither can the acquiescence of the court, no? Uh, allow for addition or diminution or confirmment of jurisdiction on any court, okay? And it is also not subject to compromise. Now, in criminal cases, it's very common, no? Um, during pre-trial, there, there are stipulants. It's very common that we hear, no? Uh, counsel stating, Your Honor, we stipulate on the jurisdiction of the court. But that's a criminal case. It's different. In the case says our jurisdiction is territorial. So, uh, uh, we know that it is tied to venue, okay? So where the, where the crime or the uh, act or omission takes place, the place also which will be tested with jurisdiction over the subject of the offense, no? That's uh, so why it is not uncommon for um, criminal cases, no? In criminal cases, for courts to allow stipulations regarding subject matter jurisdiction, at least in reference only to territory, okay? And the next, next slide, determination of jurisdiction, as already mentioned, no? It is conferred by statute, which was at the time of the commencement of the action, okay? And then the next slide speaks of venue, but as I already mentioned to you earlier, you take this in relation to the jurisdiction, no? First, you determine which court has jurisdiction over the subject matter, and then you ask yourself, so among courts, no? among the RTCs or among the first level courts, with, uh, in what place no? or, or in what judicial region should I file my case? No? So that's been talking about the place of trial. As I mentioned, the geographical location, it is plainly procedural and it's not jurisdictional. Okay. And then the next slide will just give you again a, a quote from jurisprudence. No, that uh, motto proprio dismissal on the on the basis of improper venue is incorrect, but, but then in regular procedure cases. In summary procedure, you can dismiss a civil action without any motion for any of the grounds available for the dismissal of case under Rule 16, Section 1. Okay, that's only in the in the rule on summary procedure. And then on the next slide, venue in real action. Okay, we know that any actions affecting title to or possession of real property or interest therein, the venue be the court which has jurisdiction over the place where the real property 
or any portion thereof is located. No? And then the next slide is just rule point 4.2, okay, venue of personal actions. No? In personal actions, meaning all other actions, those not involving real property or title or interest therein. No? Venue is the plaintiff's residence no? or any of the plaintiffs or venue of the defendant or any of the defendants. And this is always at the choice of the plaintiff. No? In the case of a non-resident defendant where he may be found, that's an alternative venue, right? And then what is the definition of residence here? We're just talking about actual residence, physical presence. No? We're not talking about domicile uh, and laws, okay? So only actual residence. Now, going to venue of actions against non-residents on the next slide, Lala, okay? So... They have to um, uh, look back, uh, refer, refer to the distinctions between actions in one and act in REM and quasi in REM, no? Because um, if the action involves status of a person or property of the defendant, which is located in the Philippines, or, or any interest in that, that property or, or his title to or interest in that property, then it is an Actually, or quasi in REM, no? So the subject matter there, the rest, no? That's what we need to have jurisdiction over, no? And um, if service is still required on the party, then it is only for due process reasons, okay? And then next, we have stipulations on venue. Under Rule 4.4, parties are allowed to stipulate, no? Regarding an exclusive venue. But you know from jurisdiction, Prudence, the language that you must employ no, in these venue stipulations must be strictly ex exclusive in turn. No? And if there is any room, doubt that the stipulation on venue is merely a, a deal and not really exclusive in character, then the court will always interpret it to be non-exclusive. Right. And then the next slide also shows another quote regarding stipulations on venue, for, just for your own reference your own time no now let's go to the parts and contents of a pleading okay so i want to show you on this slide here a, uh, a picture okay we took a picture of the first page of the an initiation uh under rule 65 with the supreme so there you have the cap of course everybody knows what the captions supposed to look like um uh, we uh lawyers still vary in the way they style this even in the they put cause of action or the uh, the nature I should say of their of their um of their pleading but uh of course just as a reminder again it's not going to be controlling on us no the allegations will always control it's not going to be the designation we put there and then of course just if it's an ordinary appeal no uh, let's not include the uh court of origin in the title, okay, and then um, of course in certiorari, the the public is always the court that issued the challenge or the entity or issued the challenge order uh, or resolution. Okay, so that's just a sample of um, your caption. We go to the next slide. You will see also just a part. We took a picture of the first page, not a part of the body of that petition which should set forth you know the allegations of your claims or defenses including the relief or prayer as well as the date of the pleading okay and then now let's go to the next slide this uh, one of the major changes in uh, uh, rules on civil procedure as i mentioned earlier we have embarked on a radical shift from purely ultimate facts to evidentiary matters all right so now we require your pleading to contain following matters. Okay, number one is the witnesses. Okay, so we're asking for names. You may say, but we still have the name of the witness as of now, no? Um, we see uh, very, very few instances when this will be, when this will happen. Because now requiring you to submit the judicial affidavits of your witnesses, okay, together with your initiatory pleading. So the only instance when uh, when you will not know the name of your witness is if you are trying to uh, get testimony from, let's say, from a particular office, no? But um, as of the moment, you're unable to 
to get a judicial affidavit because that particular um, position is, uh, has been vacated. Let's see that the former occupant of the position uh, uh, who will be able to render pertinent testimony in support of your client's clearance has been vacated. So that has uh, posed a serious problem you securing the judicial affidavit as well as the name of the witness. No? So in those ordinary circumstances, the courts will be reasonable and accept just the name or just the, I mean, the name of the position, okay, or the designation, if you still don't have the name of the intended witness, okay? And then and the second one is the summary of the witness's intended testimony. So we are requiring you now, no, to state in your initiatory pleading the summary of witness's testimonies, okay? So that is different from attaching the judicial affidavits, which follows as provided the judicial affidavits shall be attached to the pleading and form an integral part thereof. So why require statement no, of the or summary of the part of the uh, witness's testimonies if there will be this provision that the judicial affidavits are to be attached and form an integral? No? So as I already mentioned earlier, no, we have we round which we call failure to state the cause of action, and when when uh, that is with us, we are limited to the allegations complaint. We cannot look beyond the complaint to the attached documents, including judicial affidavits. And so, you have to state the summary of your witnesses' intended testimonies here, okay? So that we may make the courts make the necessary. Uh, um, solution in case they are faced with this particular affirmative defense. Okay? And so that's not the only reason. You also have what we call judgment pleadings. Okay? And uh, the motion for summary judgment. But of course, the motion for summary allows you to rely on acts and depositions. Okay? But uh, the judgment on the pleadings, again, no, on the basis of the party's pleadings alone. And so this is the reason why we still need the summary of your witnesses and the testimonies, okay? And then the third, documentary and object evidence in support of the allegations contained in the, okay? So does this mean just referring to the documents? Yes. For example, you have an allegation. Uh, parties entered into, um, the parties entered into a, a renewal of contract, let's say, okay? Uh, and that is your allegation. You will be attaching, of course, the renewal of contract, but you referred to it ready in your allegation, you just uh, maybe footnote it or bracket it as your exhibit so and so. Okay, uh, you do not have to state the entire contents in your pleading. Not just the reference is enough, and uh, uh, anything that will make it convenient for the court to easily find it when the court is looking at that particular action. Right? Okay. Now, alternative cause of action. We already discussed it earlier on, no? Uh, recall the joinder, joinder of causes of action, okay? And then let's go to the next. Now, please, judgments, acts. Um, there's just an additional statement here that when we're pleading a judgment or this, uh, that is clarifying, no? Uh, but the last statement there, an authenticated copy of the judgment or decision shall be attached to the pleading. We are now referring to the Apostille Convention, okay? That is the way for authenticate documents originating from foreign jurisdictions now. It is an easier, streamlined way. No longer have to, we longer have to go through the process of consularization that we, um, that we did before, which was tedious and expensive. And uh, actually caused a lot of delay, no? But now all you need to do is go to the de Department of Foreign Affairs where you will get that seal uh, certificate, no? And uh, that will take the place of the consularization, no? And on the screen, you will see the, um, the difference, no? Between um, the apostille certification as opposed to the uh, authentication in our, uh, in the 97 rules of civil procedure. But the steps that we had to go through before, but now all you need to do is get that certification, uh, the apostille certificate, and you just need to attach it to that document, and it will suffice, okay? Okay, by the apostille convention, 
became effective in our jurisdiction on May 14 to 19. So it's been a, a year already since its effectivity, right? Okay. Now let's go to pleadings, pleading conditions precedent. Okay. So in any pleading, a general averment of the performance or occurrence of conditions precedent will suffice. Examples would be administrative remedies and resto barangay conciliation and failure of earned efforts between members and family as required under the family code okay and then next we have pleading capacity to sue authority to sue and the legal existence these are just carried over from um, from the 1997 rules no but uh, i have it here because these are part of the pleadings or your allegations in your pleadings that you need to um that you need to take off actually if you go through the slides which you can you can get uh Later on, after the module is completed, uh, Alaay will uh, will upload the PowerPoint also. This will act as a checklist when you're preparing a pleading, okay? Go to the next slide, please. Pleading fraud, mistake, condition of the mind. Okay, on the one hand, fraud or mistake, it's required to be stated with particularity. And I cross-referred you to the substantive provisions in the civil code regarding allegations of fraud and mistake. Okay, and then on the other hand, you have malice, intent, knowledge, or other condition of the mind, which may be a verily, okay, for very obvious reasons. And then we go to actionable documents. What are your elements? Actionable documents or written documents or instruments upon which an action or defense is based, no? And you know that if an actionable document is pleaded, then a specific denial is required of us, okay? And failure to specifically deny an actionable document will result in an admission of that actionable document, okay? And so, um, so be very, uh, be very careful in your assessment of what are actionable documents and what are not actionable documents, okay? Very plainly, an actionable document is defined as a document on which an action or defense is based, okay? Um, I have your you, but uh, I, I'd rather uh, refer also to the case of Duarte versus Duran, no? That's a 1711 case penned by Justice Castillo. In that particular case, um, there was a sale of um, of a laptop, no? It, and it did not, the, the cost was, I think, less than 50,000 pesos. Anyway, so it was an oral contract between friends and uh, there were installment payments made but then for the last installment um the uh, um the buyer refused to pay any more and said that um the laptop was actually only worth the amount that he had already paid so he refused to pay the last installment okay and so because uh, they could not you know come to terms uh, amicably the seller brought a case against the buyer no balance of the of the price so it was a case his cause of action was founded on a contract of sale, the oral contract of sale. Okay. Now, in the course of their exchange of pleadings, the um, the seller also attached no an acknowledgement receipt of the, event of the installments by the buyer, and he offered this as proof that there was actually uh, there were actually payments of two installments, but that the installment payments were insufficient agreed purchase price no so that was, that was his purpose for introducing that acknowledgement receipt okay so it became an issue because um the uh, uh the seller was claiming that the acknowledgement receipt was an actionable document which the buyer failed to uh, specifically deny under oath and for which reason the contention of the seller was that uh, that should that um, it was deemed uh, admitted, no, admitted for all purposes by the buyer and should result in a judgment in his favor. No, the seller did win, but the seller won not on the basis of that acknowledgement receipt being a document. Rather, the Supreme Court said the the uh, seller seller's cause of action was founded on the oral contract of sale. It was oral, of course, did not militate against its existence because it was perfected upon the beating of the minds of the buyer and the seller, right? And so now the issue of the receipt 
and its use in the action was not for the purpose of uh, was not for the purpose of founding or basing the, the the claim on that particular receipt. No, it was just an incidental evidence. No, it was not the source of the cause of action because the source of the cause of action is the contract of sale. So in that particular case, the Supreme Court said that the receipt, okay, the acknowledgement receipt was not an actionable document. So I bring that up with you because I have to caution you, no, that you have to understand that only documents or written instruments uh, which form the basis of an action or defense that will be considered as actual documents. It's, it will not be documents that you attach to your in, initiatory plea, okay? And then let's go to the next slide. Still parts and contents of a pleading no now we have signature and address now this is very important and i'm very happy with this revision actually this revision regarding the signature and address we to justice robert who is also an atenean no uh, justice abad uh, when we when we proposed revisions to the rules and civil procedure back uh, I can't remember anymore w when i think that was back in 2008 uh, lala will know no and uh, this is one of the uh, major bills that we wanted. No, we want lawyers to, you know, to really uh, value, no, their uh, value their signatures, and we want the courts to be able to put equal value and credit to the signatures of lawyers. And now, finally, it is part of our rules and civil procedures. So, what does your signature now mean? No, the signature of counsel. It's not only a certificate, okay, that he has read the pleading to the, and that to the best of his knowledge, information, and belief, and armed um, after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances, it is a certificate to the following things, that he is not pursuing an improper purpose. Second, that the claims are warranted and not frivolous. Third, that they have evidentiary support. Okay? And last, that even the denials are warranted and not made for delay. So these now are the are the certificates or the things that your signature will attest to once you affix your signature to your pleading. Okay. So um, in one of my in one of my uh, seminars, uh, there was a question if we cannot ask our client the pleading instead. No. <laughs> Because particular provision, and I said no, of course not. This is the very reason why we have included this provision here, no. And this is only consistent with our ethical duties under the code of professional responsibility and also under our lawyer's oath. Okay, so on the next slide, you just have a quote regarding counsel's negligence, and then uh, rule point three. What are the consequences, no, for violations of this particular rule on the council signature? Okay, so there can be appropriate sanctions imposed by the court for violation. Okay, so disciplinary in character, there can be non-monetary, uh, or there can also be an order to pay penalty. And the most extreme uh, provision is to um, issue an order. Uh, after notice and hearing, and uh, the the offending counsel will be given to explain his side. There may be an order issued against the offending counsel to pay attorney's fees, no, and expenses of the other party. Okay, all right. So the next slide, okay, just shows you the pertinent provisions of the Code of Professional Responsibility. I just want to remind everybody, both lawyers and judges alike, no, that our first duty is not to our our first duty is not even to the courts. Our first duty is to society. And that duty is to help in the administration of justice. Okay. Let's go to that, please. Okay. So there are other pertinent issuances concerning what should be included in a council signature. Okay. Aside from your address, you need to also include the role of attorney number. Okay. And then Number three, you also need to include the um, the number and the date of the official receipt of your IBP payment. Okay, so we know this. Or if you're a lifetime member, then you have to indicate your lifetime membership number. And then number four, you also have to indicate your professional receipt number. 
and I believe the date also, no? so you know that you're updated. And then na five, you also have to include your mandatory continuing legal education certificate of compliance, or if you are exempt, then your certificate of exemption. And then lastly, you also have to now include your contact details. Okay, uh, specifically with our uh, inclusion of electronic means of filing and service, we are now asking you to please include, indicate in your pleadings uh, in the portion of your signature, your email addresses, and if you wish still to use your facsimile, then your facsimile numbers, okay? All right, let's go to verification. Okay, so except when otherwise specifically required by law or the rule, pleadings need not be under oath or verified, yes, okay? In the under the rule and summary procedure, all the pleadings are required to be verified, you have other instances listed there, okay? Petition for relief from judgment, petition for review under Rule 42, etc., etc. We don't need to go through each and every one of them. And then the next slide, how do you make a verification? Okay, we all know verification, no? And uh, the only thing, uh, or the only thing that we wanted to emphasize here is the one at the bottom, that the signature of the affiant will serve as a certificate as to the truthfulness of the actions in the pleading. That is why we call it a verification, verifying the factual allegations. Okay, now we just made some additions there, A, B, C, for consistency with the certificate that the lawyer will uh, be deemed to have made upon placing his signature on a pleading, okay? And um, the addition here is that now we're requiring you to attach the authority of the affiant, no? the one who with verification, you need to attach the authority already your initiatory pleading. Before there will be pleadings filed with us and there is no authority attached, uh, what I used to do was to issue an order to submit that authority within 48 hours or 72 hours at the most. And so that causes delay, okay? So now we want you to attach it already so we can see that the affiant is authorized, all right? And then what is the effect of a defective verification, no? We know that, is that that pleading is treated as an unsigned pleading. But this is just a procedural defect. It's not jurisdictional. And we always tell our judges, if this is a defect, then let it be cured or remedy admission of this pleading. No? This should not cause unnecessary delay. Okay. Next, both the certificate of non conforming dropping. The prints remain the same. The only addition is that now... Under Rule 7.5, we are requiring so to attach the authority of the person who executes the certificate of room shopping, okay? And then we go to the slides, which shows you the quote from the case of Nestle, right? So in the case of Nestle, uh, the court was very particular about attaching the authority. Okay, let's go to the violations and sanctions. Just as a reminder for everybody, no, when we saw the certificate of the rule on non-forum shop, there are two things that you must do. The first is to file a certificate of non-forum shopping. And one is to uh, do, do no action that amounts to forum shopping. Okay, so there are two things. Okay, the filing of the certificate and the act of forum shopping itself. Okay, so now they will show you the violations and the sanctions that may be imposed just as a review for all of us now if there's a failure to comply meaning there is no certificate of shopping attached to the initiatory pleading the sanction is outright dismissal but the dismissal is without prejudice unless otherwise provided okay so we are always told that this is irremediable okay not curable because uh this is a mandatory requirement no for all initiatory pleadings now uh there are certain decisions of the court where exceptions were made no but uh please please those are just very very extraordinary circumstances the general rule and the the rule remains no, that a non, an absolute non-compliance is incurable. Okay, then the next violation is the submission of a false certification. Okay, but before we go to that, there can also be the submission of a defective certification. Let's say that there are two plaintiffs, 
only one plaintiff since the certificate of non-forum shopping, then that's a defective submission because both of them must certify, no? Unless one is the authorized representative of the other. But if there's a defective certification, that one is cured. The prudent and the better recourse for the judges is to allow the parties to cure that defect, no? And not so that it will not unduly cause delay. Okay, and then... Now we go to submission of a false certification. You submitted a certificate of non-forum shopping, but you stated that you are not you are not aware of other case involving same parties, causes of action, but actually you are aware because you're a party in the other case. So that results in indirect contempt of court without prejudice to the corresponding administrative and criminal actions. It will also result in dismissal of the case. Okay, non-compliance with your undertaking. For example, you under because we have an undertaking that we will inform the court within five days from discovery, no, of any other action. But you discovered you did not disclose to the court, no, and the information came to the court otherwise than through you, despite your undertaking. The same sanctions, no, dismissal, indirect contempt, and administrative and criminal actions. Why criminal? Because you are making false statements under oath. All right, and then the last is the willful and deliberate forum shopping. This is the act of forum shopping itself. And, and the result is summary dismissal with prejudice, okay? The dismissal here is with prejudice, okay? Direct contempt of court, okay? Not indirect, direct, as well as administrative sanction, okay? And then the subsequent um, slides just give you, just uh, shows you uh, jurisprudence on forum shopping, which we will no longer discuss. One of them shows you the test of forum shopping. Of course, we know that the test of forum shop is if the elements of litis pendentia uh, are present, okay? And then amendments. Now we go to the rule on amendments. They remain the same, okay? And um, have amendment as a matter of right. Any party before a responsive pleading is served, okay? May amend hearing. And this is done moto proprio on the part of the party and there is no need for leave of court. If you amendment, the court will just confirm the amendments. The court does not need to give you permission. And then, of course, we have amendments by leave court. Now, uh, under the 1997 revision of the Rules on Civil Procedure, there was a shift no, uh, to liberality in the admission or in the allowance of amendments, even substantial amendments. So that was the trend that was followed since the 1997 the rules, no? But with the latest revisions now, the 2020 revisions, no, we have introduced these limitations. Before, uh, under the liberal approach, the only limitation was that it must not be for delay, okay? But in the 2020 revision, the two other qualifications or conditions, uh, and these are the amendment must not be an amendment to, to confer jurisdiction on the court, and the second one is the amendment must not be an amendment uh, to state a cause of action when there was no cause of action to begin with, okay? We'll discuss that uh, under the next slide, okay? Amendments by leave of court, no allow, we will not allow amendments to confer jurisdiction because we know that when the court has no subject matter jurisdiction over the case, the only power it has is to dismiss that case. No? It does not even have the power for that case to a different court. No? And that's why we always caution our judges if a case is misfiled, for example, with a regular court, when it's a family court, okay, or to a regular court, when it's a drugs court, we caution them against merely referring it to that court, no, or to the executive judge. Of course, other practical reasons also come into play because the filing fees will uh, uh, run away with, no, it will be gone. You dismiss it already. But please, just as a reminder, the court always always tells us judges, no, that if we do not have subject matter jurisdiction, only action we can take is to dismiss. Okay, and then um, next effect of amended pleadings. Okay, so this is this is important. We know that if an amended pleading is filed and admitted by the court, then the original pleading disappears. No, disappears, so to speak. No, it's no longer part of the record, although it may be there, but it is no longer a part of the record that the court 
to take into consideration in the resolution of the case. So what is the effect evidentiary wise, no? Where where there may be judicial admissions in the original pleading, they may no longer be used as, as judicial admissions because the original pleading is now technically no longer part of the record, okay? But they may be offered and admitted as extrajudicial admissions, okay? So, meron pa rin utility, okay? It's not totally a lost cause. The next slide uh, speaks of supplemental pleadings and, and uh, there's, not much, there's no real change here, okay? And then the next is the power of the court to make amendments, no? I just want to remind our judges listening to us today that the court has the power to summarily correct errors or clearly clerical Clericals, no? Like, for example, in our initial assessment of the complaint or, or the complaint and the answer, we see that the name of the party defendant, the documents attached is different. We could already affect the necessary corrections, no? And uh, that power, this particular power under Rule 10.4 allows us to do that. We should not wait for a motion to, to be made, no? By the parties because, for all you know, the parties will never make that motion and the title or caption of our case would always be wrong. It will always refer to the wrong name or uh, of the of the of, of a party, and that will that will have an effect in in our execution stage. Okay, and so as early on as you can exercise power to correct everything. No, of course the rule always is that there must not be prejudice to the parties. If you think that. Either party might be adversely affected. You have to notify them. And then, what are the rules on filing and service? Now we go to filing and service. No, Rule 30 uh, governs filing of pleadings, motions, and other court submissions. And uh, service, except those uh, where a different mode of service is prescribed. No? Let's go to filing in general. What is filing? It is the act of submitting some to the court, no? something in writing. Uh, not just pleadings, but other court bumpers. What are the modes for filing? Well, you have the traditional modes of personal filing. You have registered mail. Now we have this very important addition of the accredited courier. No, um, So many of us uh, use LBC and the, other, uh, and the other private couriers. But the problem with that is that under jurisprudence, it's not the date of mailing or sending through the private courier that will be the date of filing. Rather, it will be the date of actual receipt by the court, di ba? And the reason is obvious, no? Because the courier is not part of the court system. So there is no presumptive regularity in the service or filing done through a courier, okay? So we talk now in the, the couriers here, but making them accredited couriers. What does that mean? That the office of the court straighter has been tasked by the Supreme Court to come up with a system of accreditation similar to the accreditation of our companies, no? And once you become an accredited courier, then you will be accountable to the court and uh, this accountability now will uh, be uh, partnered by the perceived regularity that we can now accord to service with the accredited couriers. So from now on, if you serve through an accredited courier or you file through an accredited courier, your date of sending or filing through the courier will be the date of filing or serve. Hindi na yung date of actual receipt. No? So this is very important as we all know how how or how registered mail is snail mail, no? And we also all know that how limited the resources of the courts are, we cannot do personal service, no? And then the fourth mode is electronic mail. This is very, very important. Um, we did the revisions. Uh, the committee worked on this last year. No, we had no idea that this pandemic was going to be upon us in the, the earliest year. No, and so this is really very fortuitous. Of course, we've had our e-course for a while now, but you know we cannot we cannot spread that nationwide in one go because of the because of the risk needed for this particular uh, automation project. But with this, no. But with this, uh, we and the pandemic, we were all forced no, to resort to electronic means, not just for filing a service, but also for hearings. No. So this is very, very timely. Okay. But please note here, no, that there are only four modes of filing in general. Note here 
that fax or facsimile is not included okay and we will we will go to that later on okay on the next slide you have completeness filing when is filing deemed complete okay filing it will be the date and hour as stamped or endorsed by the clerk of court registered mail accredited courier as i i as i already mentioned it will be the date of mailing okay and then electronic filing it will be the date of the electronic transmission all right let's go to the next slides the next slide speak to you about the the time of MC or filing in the time of COVID, no? So until MECQ is in place, that, that's until the end of May. Um, we don't know if we're transitioning to GCQ, but uh, they say that that's the likelihood. Anyway, for the meeting that we're still in SEQ, okay, um, there is still a physical closure of court, discouraging people from going physically to the courts. If you want to follow up, if you want to verify anything, if you want to find anything, we want you to resort to our electronic means. No, we want you to use our addresses, contact our hotline numbers, no, and uh, do everything electronically or by distance. Okay, please do not come to court. But that does not mean our courts are closed. Our courts are open, regular hours. Our, uh, but uh, the electronic filing should be only until 3 p.m. towards time to act on them before the closure of business hours on any particular day. Now, what about the filing? Uh, but please do it also electronically. No? And what about our deadlines? What if our deadlines within the period when we are, at, we are in NECU, then you have an automatic extension of 30 days. In the same way, it also benefits us. If cases submitted for decision, which should have been decided within a date falling within the MECQ, then we also we are also given an extension. All right. And then um, hearing, uh, hearings are done through video conferencing, but at least I know and what I understand is just for pilot courts. Now, what about those non-pilot courts where they not have the Microsoft or Microsoft Teams platform? conduct hearings only in urgent cases, okay? Well, for, for health reasons. All right, and then on the next slide, I have for you the official email addresses uh, of our courts, starting with the Supreme Court. If you have it, just click on those links. And, uh, you also have the email addresses, and I, we have the links on the next slide. Yes, there. So so you can add courts from the Supreme Court down to our trial court, no? And, um, okay, so other slides still refer to the same thing, no? the uh, rules under GCQ areas, okay? You can go through them at least sure and to you the more important parts. Okay, now let's go to the proof of filing. Okay, so what is our proof of filing? Generally, the proof of filing is the existing existence in the record of the document or the paper the paper uh, or the court bound paper that you have in the record and that's for filing however if for example uh, your document is in the record and you filed it personally if you prove it you present your copy with a stamp received by the court okay what about if it's registered mail then you can present the registry receipt and the affidavit of the person who mailed it by registered mail. If you have the registry return card, then you only need present that. You don't need an affidavit, okay? And then if it's credited courier, you need an affidavit of service by the person who brought it to the courier, okay? You don't need an affidavit, affidavit from the courier, okay? Please remember that. All you need is an affidavit from the person who brought it to the courier or mailing okay plus the tracking number and the official from the courier that's what you need now if it's electronic mail then you need an affidavit electronic filing by the by the party who sent it by electronic mail accompanied by a paper copy okay or a printout okay or it can be a written or a stamped acknowledgement receipt already by the court no and then the last, any other electronic means also by affidavit of electronic filing and a copy, all right? Payment of docket fees, okay? We all know that it's not just the act of filing 
uh, that will uh, that will um, commence a civil action, but the payment of docket and other required fees, and in the absence of this payment, the court will not acquire jurisdiction over your case. Okay, so the subsequent slides only uh, show you jurisprudence regarding the requirement of payment. Um, we are not reasonable about it. If you if there is deficiency in the payment, we will give you time. If you pay to if you fail to pay, but then there is still still time within the regulatory period, we will allow you according to jurisprudence, no, as long as it's within the prescribed period. And the only caveat is that there be no intention to delay. If the non payment is caused by an intention to delay or malice of the uh, the part of the pleader who did not pay, then definitely the court will not accept late payment and dismiss the case. Okay, now let's go to service. Service in general, no changes there, except to remind you that once counsel appears for a party, service must be done to the counsel. And then if a counsel appears for more than one party, then that counsel will be entitled to only one copy of the paper that's being served, no? And that would already serve as all clients. If there is one client and there is more than then the service will be done on the lead counsel. If there is no lead counsel designated, then service will be done on any counsels appearing for that party. Okay, let's go to the modes of service. Okay, so modes of service, the same, personal, registered mail, accredited court, electronic mail. Here we have the important addition, facsimile transmissions. Okay, so please remember, you cannot through fax, but you can serve through fax, okay? And then the other addition there is service as provided for, for international conventions to which the Philippines is a party. We thought of including that already not to, to, uh, in order not to ignore our treaty commitments, okay? And then the next slide is on personal service. How do you affect personal service? Um, the new provision here is this, okay? Personal delivery, a party or party's counsel or to their authorized representative named in the appropriate pleading or motion. Okay, so your, your initiatory pleading, let's say in your complaint, you can already state there the service of all uh, service of all documents, whether originating from the other party or the court, may be made through A, the authorized representative of of the party. You can already do that under this decision, okay? And the others are just a reiteration of what we already have under the 1997 rule. Now, service of registered mail, also no changes there. And then we go to the slide on subsidized service. Okay. And um, this is only in those instances when the residence of the attorney or the client is unknown. This is substituted service by the unserved document on the clerk of court together with proof of non-service. Okay, let's go to service by electronic means or facsimile. Important, as I told you, this is a new provision um, and uh, this is something we badly need, no? But here the important condition is that there must be consent by the parties. Consent is necessary because we all know no, practically speaking, not everyone is equipped technologically, no, uh, even in terms of um, resources. So, so we have to secure the all parties to service by electronic means and faculty before we can resort to, to it. Okay. Now let's go to the next slide, please. The next slide just shows you the format. If you're going to search on it means or facsimile, then these are the, the things to show on the face of your electronic or tax transmission, okay? We need a case number, case title, the pleading, order, or document. And this is necessary so that we can easily find to what case it is, that it will not be lost and misfiled, all right? Now, the subsequent, um, subsequent slide shows you how it's done. No? It's by electronic means or email. So you have an example there that you can refer to. And then the next slide is the rule on the change of email address or facsimile number in the same manner that a change in address notice to the adversary, then you must also inform the court 
of any change in email address or facsimile number if you have consented to the service by email or facsimile. Let's say that at the beginning of the litigation, you still do not have an email address, okay? Let's just say um, you you do not have connectivity, okay? But but in the course of the proceeding, you were able to have um, internet connection no? to your office or to your, to your old. Then you can still avail of this. You can still make a manifestation to the court, your honor. From now on, uh, service may be made. Uh, to me, email because uh, now I have connectivity, and then you can give the court your email address. And from then on, service may be done to you by electronic mail. Okay, all right. If you fail to advise your change email address or family number, okay, you will be bound by the same rule of uh, failure to know the change in address, physical address, meaning that service at the old email address or facsimile proximity number will still be deemed valid service, right? Okay. The next slide shows you the rule that in certain instances, courts still require you to resort to convent modes of service, okay? And in what instances are these? First, initiatory pleadings, initiatory responsive pleadings, such as the answer, for very obvious reasons, okay? And then subpoena, protection orders, and writs, no? The, the writs and processes, the compulsory processes of the court require a return because important consequences uh, that, the, uh, that will happen no? from date of receipt. And that is we need them to be served by the conventional modes. And then appendices and exhibits, which are not ready, no, to electronic scanning. So may option of party D. And then the last are sealed and confidential documents or records. Okay. Okay. The next, next is you the rule on presumptive service of notice of court setting. This is very important. This is a very important uh, addition. No? We all know if, if you are a litigant and if you are a judge, we all know that the great cause of delay or reset is the lack proof of service no or, or our notices of uh hearing dates no whether it's whether it's pre-trial or trial or a hearing on a motion okay the lack of service on the parties no that's a great cause of delay and so um now with this rule no of presumptive service we will deem the party to have been served of a court setting if the notice if this appears on records to have been mailed within 20 calendar days prior to the date of hearing, if the address of the party is the same judicial region, and if it's and if it's outside the judicial region of the court, no, if, if it's the address of the party is outside, then 30 calendar days. So this is very important now, no. So this will also. Um, uh, I hope no. This will also make us more diligent, no, in in uh, uh, our case, no, in uh, exerting effort to find uh, from the court uh, when our next scheduled uh, hearing dates are. Okay. Now, completeness of service. So, service is deemed complete uh, under the following rules. If it's personal service. Then actual delivery or receipt service by ordinary mail. We do not really resort to service by ordinary mail, but there it's ten calendar day. By the way, the 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 inclusion of the word calendar before the word days in all the provisions of the rules of court is now uh, is now ano uh, is now the rule. Okay, that is one of the main revisions. We want we just wanted to clarify no uh, that calendar days or the, when we speak of days we're always speaking about calendars calendar days which means we're including weekends and holidays okay and there is by registered mail actual receipt or after five calendar days from notice of first from first notice of the postmaster okay say with the edited courier actual receipt or upon the expiration of five calendar after the first to deliver okay then service by email or on it means it's complete upon the time of electronic transmission or when available if there is an electronic notification of service all right and then service by facsimile then it is as indicated in the fax transmission printout you know that that small piece of paper all right and then let's go to the next slide we have a caveat in electronic service Elect electronic service 
is not going to be deemed effective or complete if the party using the document learns that it did not reach the addressee or person third. For example, I have an example there, no? You receive a mailer, mailer, de oh, mailer demon, right? Uh, notice in your inbox, no, that it did not, that it was not received by the recipient. And then next, next slide, the other example is if you have a full inbox. Next slide, there you go. So again, another example, and then you have an existent or incorrect address. So those are just some of the cells, okay? And then next, we have proof of service. Uh, personal, um, then it's the written admission of the party. It may be a signature, no? And then it can also be the official return of the server or the affidavit of the party serving, okay? Stating the date, place, or service. If it's serviced by registered mail, then it's the um, affidavit of the link party plus the registry receipt. This is the most common uh, mistake of our litigants. No, They file, for example, a motion and their proof of service is just a registry receipt. That's not proof of service because what you see in the registry receipt, just a number. No, The date's not even there. Sometimes there is no deal, no. So what you need is the affidavit of the person mailing plus the registry receipt. Uh, a judge asked me, uh, what will we do if the only attach is the registry receipt? Then my answer is there is no proof of service as required by the as required by the rules. And if there is no proof of service, the court is not going to act on that particular motion. Okay. And then um, of course, if you have the registry return card, that's all the proof that you need. Okay. You don't need an affidavit anymore. And then accredited courier, as already mentioned, and of service. Also, together with the official receipt from the courier document number, service email, service by family, and service by other electronic means, then you have the affidavit of service also, plus the um, the printout, no? The printout of the uh, transmitted document, okay? Now, service issued papers, now court issued papers may be served personally or registered mail, no? Um, Basically, judgments, final orders, or resolutions. These are important, very, very important because the, these are the documents that will put an end or will, uh, yes, write fin uh, right finis to the to the litigation, to the situation. And so they must be received by parties, and that is why we require them to be served either personally or by red. But now, now this will help us. We introduce this revision. Now you can serve it your expense through an accredited way. And this is important. Why? This was, this will also make things um, more efficient for the judges. We, we do not, uh, we, we never have to wait months and months on end for the returns to come back to us of the register to determine the finality of the judgment and issue the certificate of finality. We also do not do have all that confusion and doubt when there is a motion for issuance of execution already. No, so this will make more effective and more efficient for, for us. No, all right. Now, on the next slide, we are also given the option to serve our papers electronically. Okay, and it will have the same effect as the T, no, as service through conventional modes. But of course, as I mentioned. If you want to resort to electronic means, you have to have the consent of the parties, okay? Now, let's go to the next slide. Now, we go to jurisdiction over persons, modes of service, and return and proof of service. How is jurisdiction over the plaintiff dependent obtained? And then modes of service. What are the modes of service of summons? Okay, we're talking about summons here because we're talking about jurisdiction. And then which modes are you required to observe? And then return of service. How to prove? of summons okay now jurisdiction over the plaintiff next slide is of course acquired upon the filing of the complaint no and um that is not a problem because the plaintiff voluntarily submits to the jurisdiction by bringing his case before the court okay uh, the next slide just gives you an i uh, well an example all right and then we go to jurisdiction over the defendant jurisdiction over the defendant of course is acquired through of summons, okay? And um, 
Of course, there will be a distinction for actions in personam and actions quasi in rem and in rem because in jurisdiction, actions in personam, jurisdiction through the service of summons is mandatory, you know, uh, because uh, the defendant will not be by the decision of the court or any of its proceedings until summons is properly served. But in actions in, pers in rem and quasi in rem, it is jurisdiction arrest that is important and service of summons Summons on the defendant really is just for purposes of due process, no. But uh, the reason is because actions in REM are binding against the whole world. Okay. Now let's go to voluntary actions. Okay. This is new, and again another important revision. Okay. The defendant's voluntary actions will be equivalent to service of summons. Here we are now changing the rule in the nineteen eighty seven in the nineteen ninety seven rules and civil procedure. If the defendant files a motion to dismiss and uh, questions jury over his person, meaning in proper in service of summons, no, but raises other grounds, there is no voluntary appearance. There is no waiver of the question regarding jurisdiction over his person. But here in the 2020 rules, no, we're now stating that the inclusion in a motion to dismiss of other grounds aside from lack of jurisdiction over the purse of the defendant shall be deemed a voluntary appearance. This to me is important because again, uh, for purposes of delay, you know, there will be a question as to the propriety of the service of someone's, but then uh, uh, should rather be focusing on the other grounds in the motion to dismiss. So anyway, you are already before the court you have other grounds. This is not your only ground. Focus on the substantive grounds. No? So, and I am very happy that this is now the rule. Okay. Now let's go to the next slide. Well, we already mentioned the reason why some comments need to be served. And then the next. Now this is important. Okay. So before, there was no provision regarding the time when someone was, should be issued by the court. No? And so... During my time, what when is litigants will come to court and say, "What has happened to our complaint? Uh, we filed the complaint one month ago, two months ago, three months ago. How come no summons has been served yet? No, so no excuses anymore. No, within five days from receipt of the case, we use the word receipt, not filing, because after filing, there is a process still. If it's in a multi sala court, there will be a raffle." Now, although in our e course there is electronic raffle, but there will be some used up in transmittal of the record to the assigned court. So, so here we, we use the from receipt of the initiatory pleading. So, five days from receipt of the initiatory pleading, the court is supposed to issue the summons through the, through the branch. But here, as a reminder to our judges, no, the issuance of the summons, no, act of issuing, that's the branch clerk, but the thing to issue issues once is a judicial function and you will only direct the issuance of someone's after you have determined the no ground for the outright dismissed case so you have to make that assessment yourself my dear judges okay and we must not delegate that to our branch clerks okay what are these grounds that may cause the outright dismissal of the complaint well lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter you have uh, res judicata, litis pendentia, and of course you have prescription. Those are the four grounds that you may use for outright dismissal of the case. Of course, if there is no certificate of non-forum shopping, you may also use that as a ground for outright dismissal of the case. Okay? All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's just a quote uh, from the case of Cafe Metal Corporation. And then what are the contents of a summon? Summon. Uh, the only new thing there is paragraph B, which is actually um, a radical change again. No, here, now the court may authorize upon proper ex parte motion the plaintiff to serve summons on the defendant. Okay, so uh, on this provision, there was a rather longish debate about it. Uh, I other with two other judges, uh, Judge Jolo De La Rosa of, of Manila RTC and Judge Nino Embuscado of Makati, um, we were insisting that uh, it cannot be delegated to a party reasons, diba? But uh, then the 
actually is um, that uh, their experience in small claims has been very, very good, no? Where they have authorized the plaintiffs to serve someone because in those many instances when the defendants, okay? And so he said that it has been rather successful. So he proposed that we include this here. But uh, so we ended up with a compromise, okay? And the compromise is is found in Rule 14, uh, Section 3, where it states that um, summons may be served by the sheriff or other proper court officer. And in case of failure of service of summons by them, then the court may authorize the plaintiff to serve the summons together with the sheriff. So the sheriff must still accompany the plaintiff in serving the summons. So that was our happy compromise, okay? But then there is another... Um, but then there is another uh, qualification to that. If the service of summons has done outside the judicial region of court, then the requirement for the RIF to accompany the plaintiff no longer applies. Well, again, for practical reasons, we cannot send our RIF outside our jurisdiction uh, without great expense and loss of time, no? If we can just go back to the slide on 14 point, Lala, please. Validity of summons. There, validity of summons. Okay, just as a, uh, after, there you go. Okay, so just as a reminder to our judges, no, this is a practice that I've been many, many courts. Uh, after summons is attempted to be served, but it is unserved, the sheriff will return it to court uh, and re report that uh, it was unserved, no, personally. And then what the court does is to issue an alias summon immediately, no? So that should not be done because an alias summon should only issue when the original summon has been lost or destroyed. Those are the only instances when you issue an alias summons, okay? So let's stop with the practice of issuing alias summons every time there is a failure of personal service or substituted service, okay? All right, let's now go to um, the next slide on this where plaintiff may serve summons. Okay, so there are three instances uh, listed there. The first, I already mentioned, when the service may be done by the uh, by the plaintiff uh, upon authority of the court, of course, no? But together with the sheriff, the second is outside the court's judicial region to be done by the plaintiff. And... Um, but note, please, that there must first be an attempt by the court's process server or sheriff, and the attempt must fail. And that's the only time when the court may authorize the plaintiff to serve someone's, okay? And then the third instance there speaks of um, when someone's cannot really be served on the defendant because the defendant's whereabouts are unknown, no? And if the defendant's whereabouts are unknown, you now fall within Rule 14, Section uh, which was the rule fourteen thirteen? No, when the whereabouts of the defendant are unknown, you may serve by publication. Okay, so the rule, rule states that if the um, summons could not be served on the defendant, the plaintiff will be directed by the court to resort to other means under the rules of court to serve summons and give the plaintiff a period time within which to do so. And then if the plaintiff fails to do so, meaning to resort to the other, that would be publication. And now the court will have a reason to dismiss the case, either for unreasonable failure to prosecute or for failure to abort order, no? or failure to obey the rules of court under Rule 17. Okay, now let's go to the next slide, an authorized representative of the plaintiff. That's just for purposes of service of summons again. Okay, and then next, misrepresentation by the plaintiff. What about uh, an instance where the uh, plaintiff's plaintiff representative or the plaintiff himself was authorized by the court to serve summons? And then there was a return, and in the return, the plaintiff claimed that there was valid service of summons, the defendant was served summons in the complaint. No? And then and this one, there was no answer, a default judgment was had, but then it was discovered there was a false representation by the plaintiff. No? This now will result in the dismissal of the case with prejudice and the nullification of the proceedings and, of course, other appropriate sanctions. No? All right. Okay. So this was the reason why we were really opposing this.
this because uh, uh, we we were arguing that there is no presumption of regularity in the service done by a non-court officer, and that is why we thought that compromise if the sheriff was still going along with the plaintiff in service now because at least the the sheriff's uh the the presumption that operates in favor of the sheriff's service will still be there but then uh the problem comes in when the service is outside the jurisdiction of the court now and then next preference for personal service is still there uh that's just a quote from jurisprudence let's go to the next slide also a quote and then let's now go to the four modes of substituted service, okay? Um, well, okay, so now we made the rule very, very specific. There have been so many cases that went all the way up to the Supreme Court regarding invalid service of summons or uh, invalid substituted service of summons. So now we made everything very clear. Steps are all here, okay? Now, you can... And personal service fails no, after at least three attempts on two different dates, okay? How can you do substituted service? First, you leave copy at the defendant's residence. We know this. The only new provision here is now we put the age 18, okay? Before, it was just a person of sufficient age and discretion, okay? Now, it's 18 years. We just institutionalized what has already been said in court repeatedly in jurisprudence. Second, by leaving copies at the defendant's office, this is also not new. The only new thing here is we added the last line, no? Or someone, a, a competent person will include someone who customarily receives correspondence for the defendant, okay? So, pwede na po yung, nas, yung mga receptionist nila doon, oh, okay? Or the secretary, okay? And then, letter C, this is entirely new, no? And this is very important. This is because of delay. You know, the sheriff will go to a gated subdivision. They will not be allowed inside. They will be allowed up to the gate. No? Of course, hindi sila pwede mag-substitute and service doon. And then, if the defendant resides, for example, in a condominium, no? or the office is in a building, hanggang doon ka, hindi ka naman paaakyatin no? sa taas. And so, that is why we thought of adding this third provision, which states that by copies of the summons, if refused entry, okay, upon making his authority and purpose known with any of the officers, the homeowners association or condominium corporation, or its chief security officer in charge of the community or the building where the defendant may be. Uh, and I think that this is a very, very good provision, okay, for those evading service of summons. And then letter D, we also added service by electronic mail, but only if allowed under certain circumstances. Okay. The next slides just show you the requisites, again, of a valid substituted service. And then the next slide, what is service within reasonable time? No? Medyo um, mawawala na yung service within reasonable time because we have fixed the period to serve summons already. And then next is a person of suit and discretion we already mentioned in Signalized 18 years, and then who is a competent person in okay? Now we change this also. It will now include one who customarily receives correspondence uh, for the defendant. Okay. Now service upon domestic private entity, the the uh, domestic corporations. Okay, we know that there's an enumeration, okay, the president, the general manager, sec, treasurer, in-house attorney, wherever they may be found. Okay, that's the rule. Or, now we added this, or their secretaries, okay? Because if I'm the sheriff, I go to the company, at the lobby, I'm going to be asked, who are you here for? I will say, I'm here for the dent. I'm here for the general manager. I'm here for the treasurer. They will not allow a sheriff to go up to the office of the president, okay? Or to meet the president. The first thing they'll say is, do you have an appointment? Of course, no appointment, all right? So now we added the word secretaries, okay? So if they will be allowed to see the secretaries of these uh, officers, then good. But only in the office. No, they cannot go to the residence of the secretary and serve it there because we de defeat your purpose. Our purpose in allowing the subject to receive the service is because we are assured that by reason of the position or the relationship, the summons and plaint will necessarily surely be given to the intended party, okay? 
then or the person who customarily receives correspondence no, at that principal office for the reason already given. And then if there is a refusal not to receive and uh, or after three attempts no, or on two dates, then you can now resort to electronic service as allowed by the court. All right? Okay. Next, service by publication or constructive service. When do you resort to it? First, if the defendant... Uh, uh, one with an unknown identity or unknown whereabouts, as already mentioned. If it's a foreign private entity, if it's extraterritorial service to a defendant who is not found in the Philippines, in actions in quasi in REM. And the last one is if you're a resident but you're temporarily out. Okay. And then other modes, as I already mentioned, as established in international conventions which we are a signatory and then if the defendant's resi uh, identity or whereabouts are unknown I discussed already and then next foreign private juridical and with resident agent okay no change in that rule the next one also if um, without a resident agent but by doing business here you have several modes you do personal service through the appropriate court designated or you can do publication but if it's publication must be coupled with service at the last address and then it can be by facsimile this is very important or electronic means with prescribed pr proof of this and then all means as not made direct all right and then next is extraterritorial service again just a repeat that's for you that's for actions in rem and quasi in rem and then the next one is on rest temporarily out country already discussed now to the specific rules and service of summons, the different demographics, no? For entity, juridical personality, then you must serve on the different or the persons in charge, no? For prisoners, we serve jail warden, and the jail warden is the one who is required to submit the return. Minors on their parents or guardians, incompetent, similar, no? Legal guard on spouses. This is new, no? Now we are requiring you to serve on each spouse individually, and that is just fair. No, we do not know uh, the status between the, the spouses, no, and so we must not uh, equate the service on one as service on both. So you must serve them individually, right? Next specific rule still, Republic of the Philippines through the Sol Gen on local government units on their head or any other officer as the law or the court may direct. Entities under receivership or liquidation on the designated receiver or liquidator. And um, here, this is very important. The last one, special events of defendant, questionability of service of so already mentioned, not just size. The council now will be deputized by the court to serve summons on his client. Okay, this again, very important. Council appears in court for the sole cause of question jurisdiction. Because of claims there was improper service on his client. Let's say that it was left with a person who is not one of those authorized to receive for the client. Okay? So improper service. But the counsel is before the court. And he is already admitting to the court. He knows where his client is. They are in with each other. No? And in fact, he will not be in court if the client did not direct him to appear in court on his behalf. Right? So let's cut through this. And do what we need, which is resolve this case on the merits. Okay, so now we are going to deputize you to serve once on your client. All right? Okay. Now, um, okay, so let's go to the sheriff's return. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, now we fix the time within which the summons must be served. You have to serve it within 30 calendar days from the time that it is issued before. There were months lost uh, just for service of summons, as I already mentioned. Dun palang sa issuance ng summons, ang tagal na. Sa service ng summons, another tagal tagal. No? So sometimes you do your special inventory, six months already passed, there is no return attached to the record. So we don't want that to happen anymore. That is why I told you we uh, days mapping, we did the paces, we did all the steps and assigned time frames for all the steps. So now each and every step 
can be accurately and scientifically rated for efficiency and effectiveness. Okay? So no more excuses. Uh, we have to comply with our timelines. All right. The next one is what should be the content tariffs return? I will not discuss this with you. The judges uh, can use this no, if they, to make their attempts for the sheriff's return. Okay, go to proof of service in general. Well, this is the return just uh, done in writing by the server, set forth the manner, place, and date of service, and then the papers that were served. And it must be sworn to because it is not going to be the sheriff no, uh, if a plaintiff is authorized to serve, then he must uh, submit a return or a proof of service that is verified. Now, that is the counter, uh, that, that is a counterbalance because, because there's no presumptive regularity. Okay. And then proof of service, bonic mail, the same, no, print out. No, and then proof of service by publication, you're aware of this, that we gave it a publication. Okay, let's go back to our flow. Now we go of particular, how is a bill of particulars applied for? And then we go to the answer after that. How do you raise your defenses in your answer? And then what is a reply? When is it allowed? What is a rejoinder? When is it allowed? And then how and when do you file your responsive pleading? How do you serve your responsive pleadings? And then the last one is when can a plaintiff move for default? Okay, let's go to the bill of particulars. Before responding to a pleading, a party may move for a statement or a bill of particulars on any matter, okay, which is not a bird with sufficient definiteness or particularity to enable him to properly plead, okay. So we are very, um, we are very familiar with bill of particulars. There was also a long debate on whether to eliminate bill of particulars because of our shift from ultimate facts to evidentiary facts, no. But in the end, well. The decision was to keep this here. Uh, it might still serve some utility, okay? So when a bill of particulars or a motion for bill of particulars is filed with a court, no? Uh, there are three actions open to a court. It must be either immediately denied for being completely notorious or it can be also granted outright if there is to it, no? Apparent from the face of the pleading or if the court deems that it has to hear the parties on some clarificatory matters, the court can set it for hearing, but it must be immediately acted on. Whether one of uh, whether the court set for hearing or denies it outright or outright, the only the only uh, condition is that the court must do so immediately. All right, be the effect of the grant of a bill of particular then compliance must be effected within 10 days, okay, from notice. And then the definite statement will be filed uh, with the court, either by way of amended pleading or it can be in a separate pleading, all right? Now, if you fail to comply with an order of the court, then um, order the striking out of the pleading, which is vague, no? Or it may even be, um, it may even result to a dismissal. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Is there a stay of the period to file the responsive pleading if there is a bill of particulars? And the court says, yes, but then if, for example, uh, the bill of particulars is denied, then you will only have the balance no? period within which to file your responsive pleading, but in no case less than five calendar days. Okay, so you will note here that we did not adopt here the fresh period rule, no? Uh, before, under the rules on civil trial, a motion to dismiss, and your motion to dismiss is denied, then you shall have a fresh period, no? To file your responsive pleading. And here, there is no such thing because, and this is my, this is my personal opinion, okay? Uh, I do not know if the others in the committee share my view. Because of the extended period to file the responsive pleading, of 30 days plus one extension of 30 days, that's a total of 60 days, then I, I do that you need a fresh period because you will have enough time if you file your particulars as soon as possible. All right, now let's go to the answer. An answer, we know what, what an answer, it is your pleading which asserts your defenses. And um, well, actually, 
you for you include your counterclaim, right? Uh, it can be permissive or compulsory, but your counterclaim, the answer to your counterclaim uh, will be in the reply. Okay, so what kinds of defenses may you plead in the answer? It can be a negative defense or an affirmative defense. And there you have on the slide the distinction between the two. Um, and that is why usually in, the, uh, in an answer, you will have negative defenses first. No? Those will be your denials. And then you have your affirmative defenses after that. Okay. And let's go to the kinds of negative defenses on the next slide. You have the specific absolute denial where you specify each material allegation of fact, the truth of which you do not admit. And then as much as possible. No? Set forth the substance of the matters upon which you rely in support of your denial. You can also have partial specific denials only. And the last one is your denial by disavowal of knowledge when you don't have knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief as to the tr truth of the allegation in the complaint. Okay. And the next slide, you just have examples, examples of specific denial on legal capacity, and then you have examples of specific denial of genuineness and due execution. Just as a reminder, if it's an actionable document, if you do not specifically deny it, then you are deemed to have admitted it, okay? All right, and then let's go to affirmative defenses. Of course, you find this in Rule 6.5. Um, this is a new provision, okay? Well, not in the new, the rephrasing only, but uh, it is new in the sense that now the affirmative defenses have to be acted on by the courts without need of a hearing, okay? Uh, only in certain instances. Okay, let's go through it because this is important, okay? An affirmative defense is an allegation of a new matter, okay? Uh, which while hypothetically admitting the material allegations in the pleading would nevertheless prevent or bar recovery. And uh, some include fraud, statute of limitations, etc. I will not go through that. And then second paragraph, affirmative defenses may also include grounds for the outright dismissal of a complaint, specifically lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, litis pendenta, bar by prior judgment, and uh, prescription, of course. Okay, now let's go to the next slide, resolving affirmative defenses. Okay. Okay, in this slide on resolving affirmative defenses, you see... The shall motto proprio resolve affirmative defenses within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer, okay? So you plead your affirmative defenses. Remember, okay, general rule, no more motion to dismiss, except for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, litis pendentia, res judicata, and prescription. Those are the only four, only four grounds, four, four grounds that you can plead in a motion to dismiss. Otherwise, your motion to dismiss is a prohibited motion. So what do you do? You have an option. If you have any of those four grounds, you can either file a motion to dismiss if you want, you can just raise it in your answer as an affirmative defense, okay? If you do not have any of those four grounds, you have an option. You cannot file a motion to dismiss. You can only file an answer and raise your other affirmative defenses, as I already mentioned, no? Now, if the ground invoked as affirmative defense may be resolved on the basis of the party's pleadings, meaning the complaint and the answer, okay? Meaning it is apparent from the record. Then the court must resolve the affirmative defense within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer, okay? So the court need not set a hearing if it can be resolved on the basis of the pleadings, all right? Next, the court has a discretion for a summary hearing, Okay, the next slide, please. Yes, the court may conduct a summary hearing within 15 calendar days from the filing, sir, for the following defense. Okay. These are the defenses, fraud, statutations, release, etc. No, These affirmative defenses may be set for clarificatory hearing, or we call it a summary hearing, no, within 15 calendar days from the filing of the answer. And the court will resolve the ground which was uh, heard through a summary hearing within 30 days from the termination of such summary hearing, right? Okay, so I hope that's clear already, no? Automatic court must resolve the affirmative defense. There can be no motion to set for hearing for affirmative defense. If the court deems it necessary to have a summary hearing, 
the court alone will issue the notice of hearing. Okay? And then, let's go to the next slide. Failure to plead defenses and objections. Okay. The failure to the affirmative defense at the earliest opportunity will constitute a waiver. And uh, the, on, the only exceptions, again, as I already mentioned, are subject matter jurisdiction, litis pendentia, bar by prior judgment, and statute of limitations. Okay. Now, let's go to motion to dismiss. In general, a motion to dismiss is a prohibited motion, as I already mentioned to you. Okay. That's found in the new Rule 15, Section 12. The exceptions are, as I already mentioned, the four. No, I do not want to repeat again. It's there on the slide for you. Okay, the next slide. What is the effect if the affirmative defense or a Rule 9.1 motion to dismiss is granted? Okay, the effect is subject to the right of appeal, it is a dismissal with prejudice, mean, meaning it will bar the refiling of the action. Okay? Huh? So, so if that is the dismissal, okay, that is a dismissal with prejudice. It will bar the refiling of the action. That's the general rule. There may be exceptions in the discretion of the court. Okay? Now, the next slide, denial affirmative defense. If the, on the other hand, the affirmative defense is denied, okay, what will happen? It shall not be subject to a motion for reconsideration nor to a petition for certiorari, okay? So there is no MR, there is no Rule 65. This is what I was about at the start of the lecture, or I mean the sharing, when I said that we are uh, eliminating interlocutory incidents, which we, which we know cause the greatest delay to us, okay? So if you want to challenge the denial of your affirmative defense, you have to wait for trial finished and for a judgment on the merits to be issued. And then the time to raise it is through an appeal, no? Assign it as an error, all right? Next slide, denial of a motion to dismiss, remedy. Okay, so here you have to deem this to be um, consistent, no? We, on, we only made this consistent, no? So you have to go through trial wait for judgment on the merits, and then assign it as an error on appeal, okay? Now let's go to reply. When is a reply allowed? In general, reply is not allowed anymore. You can only file a reply if you are the plaintiff, okay? If an actionable document is appended or attached to the answer, okay? If there is no actionable document attached to the answer, you cannot file a reply. But what if you want to controvert new matters raised in the answer, although there's no actionable document. This rule provides that you raise that or you set forth your claim in answer to that by an amended or supplemental complaint. Okay, so please remember, reply is now only allowed if an actionable document is attached to the answer. Similarly, if an actionable document is attached to a reply, then a rejoinder is allowed, okay? It's only fair. Let's go to the next slide. What is an actionable document? I discussed this in detail at the start of our session. So we will now go to a rejoinder, okay, which I already mentioned to you. You can only file a rejoinder if an actionable document is attached to the reply. Of course, if you do not file a reply or you do not file a rejoinder, the allegations in the um, answer case of a reply or the allegations in the reply in case of a reply are deemed automatically controverted. So you do not really need to file it. It's discretionary. No, but if there's an actionable document, of course you want to file a reply or a rejoinder as the case may be because absent a specific denial, then that will be deemed admitted. Okay? Okay. Let's go to the next slide, which are the periods for filing of answer. Okay? So I already have that in table form for you, so it's not difficult difficult to um, not difficult to synthesize all the provisions no so answer to the complaint 30 days the reckoning point service of summons of course okay unless period is fixed by the court for instance service of summons and complaint is done by publication it's 60 days or uh, another period to be fixed by the court okay and then amended complaint if it's an amended complaint as a matter of right then it's still 30 days because it's still a matter of right. Wala pang answer yan, okay? And then, 
amended complaint already with leave of court, then it's only 15 days because to be counted notice of the order, getting leave or admitting the amended complaint because you were already notified because there was a, a motion for leave to file an amended complaint. No, So you, are, you should already be put on notice. You should already start preparing. That's why now it's only 15 days. And then counterclaim is 20 days from service. Uh, cross claim 20 days as well. Next slide, please. Third, fourth party complaint 30 days also. Service of summons on the third party, fourth party defendant. And supplemental complaint 20 days only. Kasi supplement na lang yan, okay? And then answer by a private juridical entity 60 days, okay? After receipt of service of summons. Okay, next slide. One time five an extension for an answer, all right? Okay, so. We are requiring you to file your answer now within 30 days, correct? Okay. But we are giving you one motion. Of 60 days only to file your answer. Now, we thought that this was enough, no? To prepare everything, even the judicial affidavits of your witnesses. And we thought that this was reasonable, okay? Although... I've already heard from my friends from the OSG and they are they are telling me that this is going to be parusa for them, no? But uh, my only plea with everyone is that we give session because of my internet connection i don't know if i'm back lala um we are on the slide on the uh, one time extension of the period to file the answer there you go i was explained before i was dropped i'm sorry again for my internet connection i said 30 days and then one motion for extension to file uh the answer of Another day, so a total of 60 days. Now, uh, as I was saying earlier, going to the next slide, there is a provision on extension to file other piece. So any other motion for extension of time is a prohibited pleading, or a prohibited, I should say, and it's a mere scrap of paper, okay? Um, before we leave this, I was saying before I got disconnected that I know a lot of you will complain about this, uh, that 60 days is not going to be enough for your affidavits and all other uh, documents. But can we just give it a try? Uh, I promise you, you will be as happy as I am with the results. Just give it even just six months. No, uh, Let's just give the new rules a try. And I promise you, the delays that you experienced before will be a thing of the past no? if we all give it a good try, okay? Now, let's go to the provisions on default. Lala, please, thank you. Uh, no changes here, no? And uh, just as a reminder, the effect of uh, declaration in default is that the defaulted party is no longer entitled to take part in the trial, although the defaulted party will still be entitled to notices of all succeedings, including the judgment, okay? And default may only be had always upon motion, with hearing, and that is only logical. If you want the other party to be defaulted, you have to give him notice that you are defaulting him, okay? Now, the next slide speaks of partial default and the theory of common defense. Um, an example would be um, 
people in ejectment cases, the defendants in property, no, in an ejectment case, they have the same thing that uh, if belong to one family, but they have different uh, different shelters or different um, different abodes, no, built uh, illegally on that particular property. So even if only one of them has an answer and the rest do not the others who did not file an answer will benefit from it okay next is do you seek relief from an order of default is monet for a while i guess um because of some of the thunderstorms in several areas there's really a connectivity problem but um she's not yet finished with her lecture and we're actually on until 4 30 so at this point uh we can just wait for her to come back but in the meantime i would just like to say that i'm here uh we're, there are several there is oh I think Justice Monette is back, so we'll patch her in again. Hello, Justice. Okay. Continue Hello. Po. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes. All right. I'm sorry again. Okay. Lala will go to the relief from order of default. I think we're done with that. We're with default. We're prohibited. Of course, we remember that default is prohibited in actions for nullity and annulment of marriages and illegal separation. And just as a reminder, the Supreme Court frowns upon default judgments. No? So as much as possible, our judges should always um, be very, very cautious in granting motions for default and be very liberal in granting motions to the of default if there will be no prejudice to the proceedings or to the parties. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now we're on our last topic, which is motions and then special dismiss no what are motions what motions are prohibited and then what must be heard and then special dismissals we're talking about what are the other ways of dismissing a claim other than the hearing and merits of uh of the affirmative defenses okay motions in general okay so this is very uh very, very uh, uh substantive revision uh motions in general now we are no longer requiring you to set your motion for hearing, okay? You only need to um, serve copies of your motions if they are motions in writing. We are even going to entertain oral motions now, okay? Let's go to the provision. All motions shall be in writing, except those are made in open court or in the course of a hearing. If the motion is made in open court or in the course of the hearing, then the judge will already hear the adverse party 
orally also on his objections or opposition to the motion and the judge will also resolve the motion okay and then it is in writing no and if it is based facts appearing in the record the court may have the option of hearing the matter on the basis of affidavits or depositions or even oral testimony. That is when we can have the discretionary hearing we're talking about. But in general, no more hearings on motions. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the next slide, what's important? Rule 15.5B, all motions shall be served. Okay, so the requirements of service is still there. We and uh, you can avail of personal service, accredited private courier, or registered mail, or electronic means. No, and then we go next slide. Very important non litigious motions with the revisions. We have categorized motions into litigious and non litigious motions. So, what are non litigious motions? These are motions which will not prejudice the adverse party, so you do not need to hear them. Okay, so they need not be set for hearing. And because they are non litigious then we, we are directing our just our courts to resolve them within five days from receipt. Okay, so no other no other directive upon receipt. We count five days. The court must resolve them because they are non litigious motions. Okay, what are these? You have the examples there. Uh, you have uh, motions for alias summons for extension of time. Answer only one extension of time. Okay. Okay, because a second motion for extension of time to file answer is already litigious, okay? And then you have motions for postponement uh, for the three grounds that we will mention later on, etc. And then we go to litigious motions on the next slide. Um, in litigious motions, these are the motions that prejudice the rights of the parties, okay? Um, and because they prejudice the rights of the parties, you need to prove that you served a copy on the other party. And then there is an automatic directive here that um, if the uh, motion is litigious, then you must, uh, then the court must immediately resolve it if it can be resolved on the face of the records, meaning there is no necessity to hear it. The court will resolve it within 15 calendar days from receipt of opposition. Okay, so this is what happens. There is a litigious motion that is filed Upon service to the other party, the other party has a period non-extendable of five days to answer the motion by way of a comment or, or an option. Okay? And receipt of the opposition or lapse of the period to comment or oppose, then the court is mandated to resolve the litigious motion already. Okay? So this... All these, all these actions are already automatic, no? So please do not wait for an order from the court. Okay, to uh, for you, you to comment or opposition to a litigious motion. And also the court must count the period from the service of the uh, litigious motion on the adverse party because you do not wait indefinitely for an opposition. Upon lapse of the period to uh, comment, uh, meaning the, the five-day period, then you must resolve it with, within 15 calendar day. Okay. The next slide shows you the... The examples of the litigious motions, of course, these examples, they are not exclusive. That is why in the last number, you have other similar motions, okay? And then, um, next slide, discretionary hearings on the motions. The court may, in the exercise of its discretion, if necessary, call a hearing on a litigious motion, no? In such an instance, the court will be the one to issue the notice of hearing, no? And then... Except for motions which require immediate action, the court, uh, where the court is conducted, it must be set on the hearing designated in the rules, which is Friday. Okay, now, other rules and motions. Okay, you have rule and proof of service. Again, as I mentioned, we need proof of service. And then you have the omnibus motion rule, which still holds, no? That you have to cite all the grounds for objection in your motion. And then um, if a motion for leave to a promotion shall be accompanied by being sought to be admitted. If it's a motion for leave to admit an amended complaint, then the, the amended complaint should be attached. No? And then the form of motions, as we said, you can even have oral motions now uh, under the new rules. Okay, now let's go to prohibited motions. 
Okay. Um, here you have the motions that are prohibited. First, a motion to dismiss, except on the mentioned and then you have the motion to hear affirmative defenses as i mentioned a motion for reconsideration of the denial of the affirmative defense okay we already mentioned that and then a motion to suspend proceedings without a temporary restraining order or injunction from a higher court so we will no longer entertain motion to a motion to suspend on the ground of judicial courtesy if there is no TRO or WPI accompanying. And then we have a motion for extension of time to file pleadings or other court submissions other than one motion for extension to file an answer. Then the, the, next, the last one is a motion for percent. okay? Under the vision of the rules in prohibited motions, a motion for postponement is presumed to be intended for delay. No, no I will entertain if it is based on acts of God or force majeure or physical inability of the witness to appear and testify. But you have to make a qualification. The imprecision in the language here, I believe that we should also include the physical inability of the counsel not to appear, not to testify, but to appear. Because we know that if a party has appeared through counsel, of course, the litigation is carried on by the counsel. Okay? And the restraining there that if your motion is granted, you will just have the balance of the dates assigned to you to complete the evidence presentation for on behalf of your client. Okay, let's go to prohibited motions, uh, motions for postponement. We've discussed that already. It's just the fees you need to pay the filing fees, and then next, just an example, a motion to strike the pleading. No, um, the court can entertain such a motion. No, if uh, on the face of the pleading, it is sham or false or redundant, etc. And then we have the two dismissal rules. Now we go to exped to the special dismissals under Rule 19. Okay, first two dismissal rule. This is a dismiss notice the uh, plaintiff. No, so before a responsive pleading is filed, uh, the plaintiff on its own motion or voluntarily may file a notice of dismissal. And the court will just confirm the dismissal. However, and that dismissal will be a dismissal without prejudice. However, under the two dismissal rule, if the place done before for the same cause of action, then the second dismissal will, will already be a dismissal with prejudice. All right. And then um, the next slide is just an example from jurisprudence of the two dismissal rule. It's an illustration. And then we next we have the plaintiff's motion to dismiss by leave of court under Rule 17, Section 2, okay? In such a case, if there is a counterclaim, then it is the option of the defendant to prove the counterclaim, no? Next, plaintiff's motion to this, um, still under se Section And then we have the dismissal due to fault of plaintiff under 17.3. This is a dismissal on ground of the plaintiff's um, inability to present his evidence in chief and uh, or the failure to prosecute for a reasonable time or the failure to comply with the rules or any order of the court no this is rule 17 section 3 and this dismissal amounts to an adjudication on the merits no on the subsequent slides you just have uh, a quote from uh, this decided case on what constitutes unreasonable length of time it depends on a case basis the Court, we study the circumstances each case. Now that and the first module of our uh, session. Thank you very much. And again, apologies for the interruptions. Thank you very much, Justice. That was, I let you catch your breath for a while because you've been speaking, talking nonstop for <laughs> two hours or so. Uh, so um, I know that this is supposed to be a portion allotted for a question and answer, but um, we don't really have much time. It's, it's more important that you finish the lecture, which is really expected because this is such an extensive subject matter. It's ang galinga kasi you presented it very simple, simply, and your slides are very easy to understand. So we also appreciate the visual aids. I'm sure there are a lot of people who will ask for that.
But um, mm-hmm. what we will do just because we were looking at the questions, and um, there are some that were actually answered already because they were posted earlier. So when you were proceeding with your lecture, you answered some of them already. Okay. So perhaps what we can do okay. is we can give you a copy of the questions. And if there are some yes. which you feel that you want to address, perhaps as a recap, you can, I, I don't know if you'd want to do that for before we proceed with module two, perhaps you would like to address some of them if uh, you find that it's something remarkable. So um, maybe yeah. that's what we can do. But for now, we'll let you rest okay. and we understand the interruption because okay. there are thunderstorms yes. around also. So thank right. you. Just thinking, but uh, I won't say goodbye yeah. first because we will be seeing you okay. tomorrow for module yes. two, and that will be yes. for uh, trial, trial, and judgment. So we will still Correct. be uh, with each other tomorrow. And I hope everybody who's watching, the lecture is very clear. It was a very, very nice lecture, just thinking. And what is clear Thank is you, that Dean. everybody, <laughs> everybody should know this. More people should watch module two because if we don't know this, then our cases will be dismissed and our clients will get mad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> also, uh, this is not just for litigation. I know this is step-by-step litigation guide, but this it's also for law students because this is yes. already part of the scope of the bar exams. So students yes. should also watch. With that, thank you, Justice. And we'd like to thank, thank all of our viewers. Team staying with us and bearing with us uh, hopefully the connection will be better tomorrow but see yes. just this <laughs> moment right. and we are thankful for that so with that okay. thank you everybody who uh, took part in this um, web lecture series um, congratulations to everybody our first lecture and we will see you tomorrow thank you see you tomorrow thank you